This is our first video for Calculus 1. We're using Calculus 12th edition by Ron Larson and Bruce Edwards. The first video covers section 1.1 and is a preview of calculus. Calculus is the mathematics of change. So up to this point, if you've taken algebra or pre-calculus, you probably have practiced how to find the area of a figure or the speed of an object if that object was traveling at a constant rate given other parameters. But in calculus, we are going to be looking at, say, the area of an object that is increasing in size or the speed of an object that's decelerating. So we want the speed at a specific moment of time. So both of these types of questions are related to what we call limits. So you'll see limits come up again and again throughout our study. And they are related to the two main problems in calculus, which we're going to introduce in the following slides, but again, it's something that will continually come up. So the two problems are the tangent line problem and the area problem. The first big problem is the tangent line problem. So we know how to find the slope in algebra. Remember, to find the slope of a line, we just take y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. However, if I want to find the slope of a tangent line, I only have one point. In this case, the point is P. So how can I find the slope with just one point? One thing I can do is to approximate the slope of a tangent line using a secant line. And a secant line goes from one value of our function to another. Now, you might be saying, okay, Professor Brame, look, you got a point right here. We can use two points, find the slope of this line very easily. And in this case, yes, that is true. But what we're trying to do is to generalize. So for any time that we have a tangent line, how are we going to find the slope? So we're not going to do such silly things as finding the exact value. We're going to generalize by finding a point close to P, in this case, Q, that is 2 comma 4. So I'm going to find the slope of this line using the formula for slope. We're going to use 2, 4, and of course the point P, which is 1, 1. So to find the slope, I'm going to take the change in Y over the change in X. So that's 3 over 1, which is a slope of 3. So a decent approximation of the slope of this line is 3. Let's find a closer approximation. So instead of point Q, I'm now going to use point R. Point R again is a secant line. Uh, I'm sorry, point R is a point on a secant line RP. And we can find the slope of that line in the same way that we did before. So 2.25 minus one, because one comma one is our other point, and 1.5 minus one. So 2.25 minus 1 is 1.25, 1 1.5 minus 1 is 0 0.5, that gives me 5 halves. So 5 halves is a decent approximation. Now again, you might be saying, yeah, I got it, we already can see that the slope of this line is 2. And that's true, but again, we're looking for how to generalize. So we found a point that's close, we found a point that's closer. It would make sense if I chose another point that was closer to P than R was, that I would get closer to that exact value of two. So how close can we get? How close can that new point that creates the secant line get to our original point P? Well, we can get infinitely close as Q approaches P, and you're going to see words like this, as Q approaches P, so as Q, or our second point, gets closer and closer to P, our secant line will get closer and closer to the actual tangent line. And in calculus, we are going to use something called the limit, the limit as Q approaches P, and that is going to give us the exact slope at the tangent of the tangent line at P. The other big problem is the area problem. And that problem says, okay, you know how to find the area of a rectangle or a triangle or a trapezoid, but how do you find the area of this figure? So how can we do that on an interval from A to B? Again, just as we did in the tangent line problem, we took something that we knew how to do, 
and got closer and closer to the point. So here's something we know how to do. We have three rectangles and the height of each of those rectangles is just the left hand side of the interval. So again, if I have f of one, that value is 4.5 and f of two, that value was two and f of three, which is just the y value at three is 1.5. So you can see that this does give us an estimate, but here is a part where I've overestimated the area, and here I've overestimated the area, and all of this, I've underestimated the area because I didn't take that into account. So eight is a decent um, area estimation, but it's not correct. It makes sense then if I continued to make smaller rectangles that there would be less area that I'm under or overestimating. So in this question, I have overestimated again some, but not as much as before, and I have underestimated some. Now, what is this area? Again, I just found the left hand side, and I've multiplied everything by one half because, again, that was the width of each rectangle. So it's one half times 4.5 plus one half times 3.188 and so forth. And so that estimation is 7.72. Now, is that the correct answer? Of course not. But the point is that we're finding a system that will work as we learn more and more about calculus. As we increase the number of rectangles without bound, so instead of six, there's 12. Instead of 12, there's 147. So that approximation is going to become better and better and better because the amount of the area missed or overestimated by the rectangle is going to decrease. So it's going to get closer and closer. So again, our goal is to determine, and there's that word again, the limit of the sum of the areas as the number of rectangles increases without bound. So again, the notion of limit allows us to do that. We can move the point Q closest to p and find that limit we can increase the number of rectangles without bound and find that limit so either of those methods are going to provide us with an exact measure instead of just those estimations that we've been finding to this point now that we know why limits are going to be so important to us we're going to start looking at some techniques for finding limit so we'll start by finding limits numerically and graphically